Here? Do you see Mario waiting for the spring transfer portal window to get a quarterback? Depends on this whole window. Uh, so you, so the win, the transfer portal is closed, i.e. you're not having new players enter the portal anymore. I know that Alabama had a bunch of guys announced just after the bowl, their bowl game uh, and everything because of the timing with the semifinals and yada, yada. I get that. Um, but they still had to have put their name in before the deadline, and it just got announced with like nine of them in half an hour today. But that was really just all the journalists – kind of giving them the space to you know play in the in the semifinals and then uh news dump all of them out so you're not having any new players that are not already in the portal go into the portal currently but again you have a malachi nelson out there uh you know former five star like number one from los alamitos uh california um he's a guy and who knows you know with that obviously i i would hope that miami's called him um, as we've turned our focus elsewhere since our number one target is going to the NFL draft. Um, but yeah, I really think it depends. I don't really think that I'm forgetting anybody. So I'll go so as far, Paulo, as to say this. I think that the answer to your question is contingent upon what happens with Malachi Nelson. If he comes to Miami, then I think that we would stand pat with those four, you know, have a four-way quarterback battle. Whoever wins, wins. If Malachi Nelson does not, end up at the University of Miami, then I think you're looking at the spring window to add a depth player uh, moving for next year. Yeah. Light skin cage. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for the contribution going in a direction that I was going to lead us in to a certain extent. Love the show per usual generic question, but how important is year three for Mario Cristobal? Given the trend over the last 20 years that a vast majority of successful upper tier power five coaches and programs win 10 games by year three is nine or 10 wins a must. How important is year three? Very given that trend. Yeah. You want to be moving in the direction of double digit wins, whether that's regular season or including a bowl game win. You definitely want to be on that path and trajectory. Now, if you have linear growth from this year, right? Last year to this was plus two wins. This year to next, plus two wins. Then you're at nine, right? I don't, I mean, like growth is not necessarily always in a directly linear uh, thing. You know, it is progressional. Sometimes you take a step forward, sometimes you take a step back. Uh, but if there is linear growth, yeah, I think that that would be really great. But looking at the schedule, Again, as we've been saying so many times, it sets up very well for Miami to push for that level of success. Is Miami able to get out of Miami's way and achieve that kind of positive result throughout the course of the season? We're going to see. But, yeah, is it – this year is important very. Um it, yeah, and again, especially I counted 20, sorry, 22 as year zero. You had a little itty bitty piece of a recruiting class because Mario came late in the cycle and you're tearing everything down to the foundation. This is year one, next year, you know, is year two, but year three of recruiting in this with a full cycle to recruit. Um, but yeah, you really are getting to the point of, and I mean, I need to write it this week, but in looking in, you know, my purview of the recruiting rules and the recruiting rules recap and everything, we're hitting every single rule all up and down the list of how you build a championship team, how you improve this roster, how you do all those things. And rule number nine at the end is win. You have to give people demonstrable work product, proof of concept, not Still the abstract, but in the tangible. We went on the field with the guys that we're bringing in, and we won these games. Again, if you win the Georgia Tech game, and you win the bowl game, or another game along the way, you're at nine wins coming off of five. You got freshman All-American. The team looks different. You got a couple key transfers that are starring in some places. Now, you're selling that. Saying, hey, now. Jeremiah Smith, 
cherry on top. We're all we've already taken this massive step forward with what we got. You come here and then you're putting us over the top, right? That's really where things are going to go, especially because yes, recruiting is based on relationships, but it's also based on performance. And it's real easy for other teams to negative recruit the way that it looks on television because like nobody showed up against uh, you know a ten win Louisville team on Senior Day and we lost, and the bowl game and things like that. So you're like, hey, the last time that you saw them, excuse me, play well was in September against another team that only went seven and five against anybody else. Mm, you really want to go there? Is that what you want to do? Right? Clemson. Mm, yeah, fine. Fine. I'll give you that. Um, sure. But are there, are there really more instances than that? Than like the middle of October, early middle of October? Not really. Right? So you have to have the work, the, the results to back it up. And how's that going to happen with a strong year three um, of this cycle for me, year two, uh, but year three of recruiting and getting towards that uh, double digit wins, either in the regular season or with the bowl game, that has to really be the goal. Obviously, we always want to go undefeated, da, 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 but like being realistic, this I don't believe this team is an undefeated kind of team right now. So then setting realistic goals. Yeah. Should we be pushing for that 10 wins total regular season, postseason, whatever you want to call it? I think so. And it's really going to be incumbent upon everybody to get there this year. When I evaluate situations like this, I tend to go to the historical route and try to look at like situations. And aside from very different type programs that don't have the resources, the talent base, all of that, like a Bill Snyder at Kansas State, where he basically took a dearth of nothing and made it something. Mm -hmm. Those aside, usually when somebody shows up who is ultimately successful at a place where, sure, there are issues and dysfunction, but man, there's a gold mine of untapped talent, resources, everything that you could ever want, location and so forth. They usually make it happen. Somebody correct me in the chat. It usually happens fairly soon. No, you're right. And, you know, that I think that gets to Light Skin Cage's question. Like, yeah, it's not usually. When you have a, for example, like a Bill Snyder at K-State, that was a developmental program. Like, you're going to have, you know, fifth-year senior laden teams. Like, it's going to take years down the road for the seeds that we're planting when we first get there to then spring into the trees of success. But in most other places, uh, successful upper power five coaches and programs, it is more on the early side with success than late. I mean, you can look all over. You look at, I mean, I know that his run has been incredible, but look at Saban in Alabama. Alabama wasn't Alabama when he got there, right? It's not what it is now. That happened fairly quickly. When he was at LSU, look at Jimbo at Florida State because Bobby and them, they were good, but they were not the 90s into the early 2000s Florida State top five for four, 13 years in a row. They were not that Florida State. Jimbo gets there, they win pretty quickly, and then it fell off. You can look Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. You can look all the – I mean, look, Kalen DeBoer over at Washington. You can look all these other places, right, that – I mean, Pete Carroll, when he was at SC, you can name lots of different ones where very early in the tenure, that's when you ascended to the top of the mountain. So again, to the question that's still on the screen, yeah, it is really imperative that sooner than later, i.e. this year or next year, Miami really pushes towards that. But even if they don't, fully expect Mario to be here for at least five. Like, they're going to give him five full seasons come hell or high water, you know, even if it's eight wins, nine wins, seven wins. I know that you don't like hearing that, but it's true. Unless the bottom falls out, he's going to be here for five full seasons, especially if he recruits the way that he is. So, you know, we'll see. My mind was making all those stops mentally that you just did. P. Carroll first year at USC and I'm I'm taking all these locations that are on the Miami level meaning mm -hmm. 
this is where you can win a national championship. There's only about 10 or 12 places in the nation. You can realistically say you can win a national championship there. P. Carroll, USC, year one was six and six. And then boom, they're in the Orange Bowl. They're winning the Orange Bowl. They're top five in the nation. And then psh, they're off to the races. Urban Meyer, which kind of surprised me when several months, no, this would have been prior to Mario Cristobal. You said, give me Urban Meyer, uh, regardless of what you think of him as a person. Obviously, he steps on campus. Boom, Florida. Boom, they're off to the race. Ohio State, boom, they're 12 and 0. They're off to the races immediately. Nick Saban, Alabama, one year at seven and six, then boom, SEC championship game. They're in the top five in the Nate. They're, they're off to the race. It usually, these kind of guys, there's not many of them, but they make it happen in a hurry. I mean, I think that, what's the name? Uh, hold on, I'm just looking it up right now. Um, Dabo, four and three took over. Nine and five, six and seven, and then 10, 11, 11, 10, 14, 14, 12. Like it was, you know, okay, one, two, three, well, two and a half because he took over midway through the yeah. 08 season. So he got two full seasons, nine wins, and a top 25 finish, and a bowl win in the Music City Bowl, seven and or six and seven, and lost the Meineke Car, uh, Car Care Bowl, and then 2011 on up until 2022, double digit wins every single year. So even someone like that, at a non-traditional powerhouse that hadn't won anything since, I mean, like, I'm no spring chicken, and they hadn't won anything in my lifetime until Dabo. You know what I mean? Like, it had been, what was it, 1980 they split it with uh, Georgia? 81. Oh, so the year I was born. Okay, cool. So, you know what I mean? Like, it, they had not done anything, but even still, it got on and popping from pretty average – I mean, look, we all remember the phrase Clemsoning where they looked like they would be something and then found a way to, you know, steal, you know, their own joy and like lose from the, you know, uh, ability to win a la Miami with Georgia Tech this past year. But like Clemsoning was a thing and he overcame that. And like I said, two full seasons, nine, six, and then the sky was the limit. So, yeah, you want to have your coaching program, uh, get on that same path in the, in the now time frame would be great. Yeah. All right. We've got a uh, light skin cage coming back with this one just to provide evidence, Michigan, Texas, Washington, Clemson, Florida state, Notre Dame, Ole Miss, Bama, Oklahoma, LSU, Penn state, Oregon, Wisconsin, etc. All win 10 games by year three. All went on to be nationally relevant the last 20 years. Exactly the conversation we we're having. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, yeah, even extend that out, James Franklin, even, um, you know, at Penn State, when you had uh, different coaches at Wisconsin, um, all these other schools. Yeah, exactly. Like you wanted really in that year three kind of time frame. So it really depends on what you believe again i count your uh i count 2022 as year zero not year one although if you want to be true right that's year one last year was year two and then this is three so but i'm on record as saying that that was a year zero situation i've been i've been said that i've been said that but it would be actually four real seasons not the way that i'm looking at them but real time you know calendar years so yeah, the, again, to the point, and it's a really great question, uh, supported with really a, a great follow-up as well. Yeah, Miami finding a way to push up towards that double-digit win total in the now time frame is historically when and where you would want that to be. You might be able to extend it out a little bit in my viewpoint to the uh, 25 season. Only because my, uh, you know, Mario Cristobal is going to continue to recruit at an elite level. So hopefully you're going to have the talent. But like, he makes a great point, man. Like you're really starting to look at targeting that year three, more or less. Bob Stoops took over Oklahoma at its worst ebb in 50, 60 years. One seven and five national championship. Boom, year two. All right. Eddie's been with us for a long time. Appreciate you being here, man. 
Good evening, gents. Mario is not only a poor game manager, he also does not manage the roster well. Guys like uh, Lichtenstein and uh, Lou Cristobal should not be starting. Jakari Brown should have started uh, since the Florida State game uh, to prep him for 2024. In terms of the bowl game starters, I take that with some understanding. You know, like Matt Lee and Javion Cohen are going to the NFL. Now, do I think that Lou Cristobal, that is the nephew, Luis Cristobal, do I think that he should have played? No, it should have been Matthew McCoy. Like, I don't even, I don't think that there's really a question there. And every time I looked up and Luis Cristobal was on the field, he's either on the ground or he's facing the wrong way and getting spun around and beat by somebody. Like, on fourth down and everything, it's just like, everybody held their block, but your nephew. Like, I mean, I hey, Lichtenstein didn't start. And he actually played a halfway decent game. But at some point, like, he, he's a seventh-year senior, right? And he's also big. And we needed big dudes, like, to play along the defensive line. So, I mean, he didn't start, but he did play in the game. I am less I am less upset about Lichtenstein. I almost called him Adam, who's a journalist friend of mine. Um, I forget his name. Uh, Jake, Jacob Lichtenstein. I am less perturbed with him getting snaps than I am with Luis Cristobal. Um, but, yeah. I mean, and but managing the roster, again, you're taking into account it's the transfer portal window, and then you're going to be depleted at some spots when you have guys leave, especially with a roster that we know does not have the kind of depth that we need it to have at present anyway. Right. So you really need those top line guys there and playing to their level, but then they remove themselves from the roster on both sides of the ball. Okay. In terms of should Jakari Brown have started since FSU to prepare him for next year? That is an interesting quandary because you have to assume that Miami is putting him in position to be the starter singularly next year. You know what I mean? But with what we saw from Emory Williams in everything this season, winning the you know backup job and everything like that, that wasn't necessarily a sure thing. So I know he was like saying after, after the injury, you know, like, look, Tyler's not coming back, whatever, whatever, which I've been told y'all since the off season. But you still have to hope that, like, your most tenured guy at the position can figure it out, you know, grit grit his way through some performances and find a way to win some games, as opposed to playing Jakari, burning his red shirt, which he was fiercely protective of, and things like that. So I don't – I see where you're coming from by playing the result as the process, but – I don't necessarily agree with that and didn't along the path of the way that the season actually went, if that makes sense. I don't recall us talking about Lichtenstein since he showed up from USC and played in the spring game. And I'm just thinking, who is this guy? He's pushing dudes into the backfield. He's batting passes down. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he was, he was a rotation guy, uh, you know, spring. We're a little bit light on the roster as well. Um, but, I mean, he's another local guy come back home from uh, Cypress Bay High School in Weston uh, and everything. So, you know, that was good for him to come back to South Florida, be able to play for Miami, um, you know, get another Masters or two, depending on how he did in his couple years here uh, and everything. But, yeah, he was a rotational guy. He was like a two-slash-three. I mean, we had Branson Dean and uh, Thomas Gore as defensive tackles from the transfer portal. Then you had Jared Harrison Hunt and Leonard Taylor. Uh, and then Lichtenstein was, you know, in that that two, three kind of rotational area and things like that. But yeah, I'm less I'm less concerned with the fact that he played in the ball game 